to Job. Uh, Job was getting a little uh, ahead of himself, and God had to put Job in his place a little bit. And he asked him these challenging questions. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young? Their strong ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go forth and do not return to them. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass? to which I have given the steppe for its home, the salt land for its dwelling place. It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as it, as it pasture, and it searches after every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will it spend the night at your crib? Can you tie it in the furrow with ropes, or will it harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on it because its strength is great and will you hand over your labor to it? Do you have faith in it that it will return and bring grain to your threshing floor? The ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage, for its le it leaves its eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. It deals cruelly with its young as if they were not its own. Though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear, because God has made it forget wisdom and given it no share in understanding. When it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and its rider. Do you give the horse its might? Do you clothe its neck with mane? Do you make it leap like the locust? Its majestic snorting is terrible. It paws violently, exults mightily. It goes out to meet weapons. It laughs at fear and is not dismayed. It does not turn back from the sword. Upon it rattle the quiver, the flashing spear and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, it swallows the ground. It cannot still stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, it says, aha. From a distance, it smells the battle, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? It lives on the rock and makes its home in the fastness of the rocky crag. From there, it spies the prey. Its eyes see it from far away. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. This series on holy X, X being lots of different things that stand for sacred, we are looking for the sacred and the everyday ordinary things of life. The last couple of weeks we've talked about water as sacred and about the holy person, the sacred person. And last week, Eric talked to us about the sacred vocations. And this week, we get to talk about animals. This whole series is discussing that concepts of the Phoenix Affirmation number three that says Christian love of God includes celebrating the God whose spirit pervades and whose glory is reflected in all of God's creation including the earth and its ecosystems, the sacred and the secular, the Christian and the non-Christian, the human and the non-human. Today, we're talking about animals, which I think is an incredible quirk of fate because I live indoors <laughs> and I am not a nature person. So that I get to tell this story about animals is incredible to me. But a second quirk of fate is that one of my all-time favorite books is this one called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. 
It was required reading in college, otherwise I never would have read it because the only place to find it is in the nature section of the bookstore, which I never go to. But it was an astounding tale of her life. Sitting, she, she's an English teacher at uh, Wesleyan University in Middleton, Connecticut. She's written all kinds of poems and novels. Um, she has won all kinds of prizes. She's a phenomenal writer. If you've never read any of her stuff, I would recommend her to you highly. But she, she lived all of her life in New England and she took off once and went to a creek in Puget Sound in the Northwest section of the United States and just sat there watching the life that existed all around this creek. She saw all kinds of things she never was aware of before and valued the intricacy that she was seeing there. There was so much variety and so much life in abundance there that she felt that she had something to learn from it. Some kind of resting as well as uh, movement in life. That it wasn't just getting up every day, going to work to pay for the car that you need to only go to work. But rather you were part of all of creation which has its own meaning and purpose and flow in the world. And she wanted to try to understand what that was all about. This trek to the creek was her shot at doing that. And because she shared her vocation of being able to write and describe what she saw in connection with who she was as a human being observing another part of nature in which she was a part of but knew nothing about, I was able to participate in that. And I didn't even have to go outside. So she's an incredible writer. And this story talks about the abundance of life. What she calls that, of course, is fecundity. And when I was in college reading this for the first time, I actually had to look that up. Fecundity talks about the abundance of, the, uh, of life, of the ability to recreate that fertile ground of, of, that we live in, that we grow from. And this fecundity of life is something that she was watching all around her. The reproduction of life and the variety and the diversity of all that was that she was watching was something that astounded her over and over again. But at the same time, she found herself in the middle of a paradox. Because while she was watching that abundance of life, she was also watching the inevitability of death. And that was a paradox she was going to have to find her way through while she sat there by the creek. She had just as many stories about water bugs sucking the life out of frogs as she did the overgrowth of, of butterflies and all the things that, that uh, uh, survive in mass at the creek. So there was death as well as life. And what she realized is that she had to somehow come to terms with this paradox. And in her writing, this is how she dealt with it. Her question was, either this world, my mother, right, Mother Earth, is a monster, someone who raises things up only to watch them die, or I myself, human, part of this world, am a freak, that I'm the abnormal, anomaly sitting here watching this that I don't quite fit into the nature that I'm supposed to be a part of that whole creation that humanity is one section of and dwells with all the rest of it seems to be completely out of balance for her and she has to find a way to struggle with that she does that through her writing and her observation and what she comes up with of course is that life and death are not two separate things but rather, they're the same thing. In order to live, you have to die. Where have we heard that before? Life and death are all part of the same spectrum of what it means to be a part of God's creation, to be a part of all that is. And she was able to struggle with that in her observations while she sat there by the creek and be able to share all that with me. Now the animals that we talk about mostly when we talk about our relationships with animals are those furry wonderful pets that we have in our home, right? Because if they're not those few species of pets that actually we allow into our homes, I probably know nothing about them. 
but it was clear to me three years ago or so when we had a pet blessing here at Countryside, uh, when people brought their pets forward, the diversity and the variety that people actually had as pets was much more than I thought they would have. It wasn't just cute little dogs and cats, right? There were lizards and there were snakes and there were spiders and there were all kinds of things that I didn't really want to touch and I had no idea I was getting myself into, right? But they brought them because they were near and dear to them. The relationship that the folks had with their pets exactly showed me that experience of how they experienced the love of God in the world. Their relationship with their pets showed them the generosity and the unconditional love that God brings to all of us. And they experienced that, that true face of God through their pets. My daughter is someone who also has this experience. She is what we call a dog whisperer because she is one of those people that dogs just naturally attract to and she sits with them. Her job for the last couple of years was literally sitting in a, a vacant room on the floor with dogs jumping all over her at a doggy daycare center. And that was heaven for her. She had a blast. But she ha was raised with a dog named Minnie. She's the big coon hound on the brown dog here. And Minnie was twice her size outweighed her by a lot <laughs> and yet their companionship and their relationship grew so strong that one without the other seemed off somehow and I never had to take care of Minnie because Maddie always did just because she loved her they literally grew up together they came Minnie came to us at four months uh, Maddie was like five years old at the time and uh, Minnie uh, lived till just before Maddie graduated from high school. And through her relationship with Minnie, Maddie learned how to console and to be consoled, how to love and to be loved, how to understand that death is actually a part of life. She was there when Minnie collapsed from a heart attack and had to try to pick up this 96 pound dog and get her in the car and take her to the vet only to find out that she had died on the way. This was the love of her life and the pain that she experienced in that death of that dog was phenomenal. And yet she turned around and rescued a senior dog. Her creature in her life now is Sydney, the black pug. Sydney was 10 years old when she adopted him, rescued him. She knew that Sydney is not going to last very much longer. Pugs usually last around 13, 14 years max. And yet Sydney has become an integral part of her life. They spend 24 hours a day together. Sydney just follows her around. And if you're going to hug her or something like that, Sydney's right there jumping all over you because she wants a hug. He wants a hug too. And many, or Maddie knows that Sydney's going to die and that she's gonna experience that pain again. And yet she would do it over and over and over again because of that experience that she has of the generosity and the unconditional love that pets show to humans. It's that face of God that she's seen every time she looks at Sydney. And she's not alone. Our arts affirmation students, the fifth and sixth graders, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, did a photography pod project this week where they had to talk about their family pets. And these are some of the pictures. This is butterscotch and calico. The next one is sassafras and, oh, Fanny. Thank you. Fanny of Omaha. That's what it is. Fanny, Fanny Milbanks or something from from Omaha yeah that's what it is yeah those are Amy's cats and look at the picture of that cat who wants to live with that cat <laughs> but in that is the face of God and our students have all kinds of stories about how their relationships with their pets connect them with that love of God and by learning that and living among that, even in the midst of the living, dying paradox, they are able to see the face of God and connect to something bigger than themselves, connect to that holiness that's open to all things, not just people, 
but plants and animals, Christian, non-Christian, all those things, right? This is how animals connect us to the face of God, and we all have stories. Paying particular attention to their behavior in the world is going to help us share that connection with all the rest of creation. Please stand again for another hymn together. of Jesus, who is a lot more of an outdoorsy person than Pastor Chris. <laughs> what do you think? If a, sheep, uh, a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? If he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. 
the number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. This week I read an article from um, Yale that it was from their forestry and environmental department and they were they announced that cougars have just been uh, officially declared extinct in the northeast of the US cougars now there are these lists of endangered species that are out there um, some that are threatening extinction some that are extinct just in certain areas of the world, and some that are extinct altogether. And on that list, there are 2,340 different species that were listed as either being threatened or extinct, at least in some part of the world. That's a huge number. And how do we set that alongside that whole understanding of God and that lost sheep? One single sheep, right? What about all those creatures and species out there that we don't even really even know exist, that aren't on any kind of a list, even as existing, much less going extinct? And what is our responsibility to that? What is our connection to that? Our video that we just saw from the Sustainable Human Group, are, it tells us how intricately one small change in an ecosystem will change everything dramatically, right? Just an introduction of a small amount of wolves in the Yellowstone Park changed not only the animals that were around, but the plants and the water itself and how it ran, which changed the physical topography of the place. We are all connected in so many ways that we don't even know that one small behavior change would change everything. Animals are a part of creation, as we are. Bees, for instance, recently we've been hearing about the extinction of bees. And we think, oh well, bees, I don't have to worry about being stung in the summertime, right? What could a little bee do? Well, it's incredible what a little bee does. Honeybees pollinate 70% of the, 
of the 100 crop species that provide us with 90% of our food. There are 100 crops that are listed in which we get our food sources from. And those are pollinated 70% by honeybees. So if honeybees were to go extinct, all that plant life would die because they would never be able to be pollinated. Which means those boundaries of those uh, rivers in Yellowstone wouldn't have their boundaries anymore. It would start to meander again. All of the foliage and stuff on the sides of mountains that keep mountains intact and all together, roots of plants that connect to the earth, that connect to the mountainside, would no longer be there. So there would be mudslides continually of earth dropping from the mountains until there is nothing left but barren landscape. It affects the plants that we use for regenerable fuel systems. So we have less opportunities or less alternatives for fuel sources. It involves all the plants that go into textiles. That means the very clothing we wear is affected by bees. There isn't really a, any part of our lives that honeybees don't touch in some way or another. And yet because of pesticides and this blood disease that only replicates itself in bee colonies, bees themselves are threatened by extinction. So by their extinction, our extinction is threatened. Everything is connected to everything else. And by sitting at the side of a creek, Annie Dillard was able to show that connection and see it herself for how she is related to all that is. And by going out and watching the life at Yellowstone National Park, you'd be able to see the connection of all that is, how one thing connects to another thing and how one small thing changes everything. I know that, and I don't even go outside. <laughs> so it's astounding, that connection. It's not random. And it's not something that doesn't have meaning or purpose behind it. It's all connected. It's too intricate to be random. This is the very face of God, the sacred that we see all around us all the time, even when we're swatting that honeybee away. So how do we connect? Will it take the extinction of humanity itself before the earth is able to begin healing itself again? If humanity and the whole climate cr culture or crisis becomes so extreme, and some would say we're already too late to stop it. And humanity becomes extinct, it's not the earth that's going to die. The earth will regenerate itself. The question is, will humanity be a part of that regeneration or not? So how do we start sensing what our connection is? How do we stop long enough to watch the world around us in the non-human form and learn from that behavior in order to make some key changes in how we behave in the world so that we become even more a part of nature, more of connecting to that face of God, that sacredness, that holiness that is open to all creatures. What if we sit by the side of a creek for a time? What if we take seriously that God is constantly watching and looking for even that one sheep that's lost? God is in charge of galaxies and yet is constantly aware when some one thing is lost. If we take seriously what it means to have earth as it is in heaven, then perhaps we can pay a little bit more attention to what we're throwing in the trash. Perhaps we will spend less time 
worrying about the type of clothes that we have and how our clothes affect the world around us, like the plastics that we use and what that's doing to the water supplies, the chemicals that we throw into the air and into the water. Those are all things we control. We can be aware of our behavior by watching the rest of how nature exists with all of us. Animals show us the very face of God and connects us to that holy, that sacred. So how will we start paying attention? In our film, we saw the idea of what they called the trophic cascade. That idea that something stops at, starts at the, a change starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles down to the very bottom of the food chain. God and God's pervasive love exists in that same manner, in not necessarily top to bottom, but all around, that whole ripple effect where a meal, a simple meal like this, where on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took bread, grown from the wheat of the fields, broke it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And again, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, a new covenant that allows eyes to be open, connections to be made, and love to be shared. This we do in remembrance of him. We do this in connection with all that is, bringing us together in communion into that sacred holiness that connects us all. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to participate with us. You do not have to be a member of the congregation in order to participate. You don't have to believe in any particular doctrine or dogma. All we ask is that if you choose to participate, you come forward. And if you choose to participate from your seat, you just raise your hand and our uh, deacons will make sure that you are served right where you're sitting or you don't have to come at all. All we ask is that you surround yourself in the love of God that this meal is part of. But if you come forward, we ask that you take a section of the bread from the loaf and dip it in the juice. And as you take it in, you understand and think about how you yourself are part of that tropic cascade, the part of that ripple that starts from a small act and creates new life all around it. As our ushers come forward to prepare our meal, let us remember together who we are and whose we are. We are an inclusive, open, and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse, yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. Amen. Please come.